Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Hades. Hades is the king of the underworld and the god of the dead, and I'm not sure if it gets any darker than that. It was believed that just by speaking his name, he would have the power to bring you to the underworld, so people tried to avoid his name like it was Voldemort. Hades was sure to never let any souls that entered the underworld escape, and he would punish anyone who tried, or anyone who tried to save someone in the underworld. One of his darkest myths is in reference to the time he kidnapped Persephone. Persephone. He opened up the earth where she was picking flowers and he kept her in the underworld. Persephone's mother, Demeter, was of course really unhappy about this and did everything she could to get her back. Hades finally agrees to let her go, but of course there's always a twist with these guys. He gives her a little pomegranate seed as a parting gift, which she eats. Little does she know, if you eat food from the underworld, it binds you to it. So now she is bound to Hades, and basically the story ends off with her being allowed to live a few months of the year on Earth, but the rest of the time she is stuck in the underworld. So yeah, Hades is just out there kidnapping people, which is just really super uncool. In our number 9 spot today we have Loki. Loki is a Nordic god and he is quite the little trickster as he basically deceived his way into becoming a deity. Basically there is a place called Asgard and when that was being built by Odin who is the king of gods, Loki came and offered to help out with the build. To make a long story short, basically there was a giant helping with the build and Loki made a special deal with him. If the giant finished the build by a certain time, he would be owed the sun, the moon, and the goddess Freya. Odin obviously didn't want to give these things over, but Loki assured him that the giant wouldn't be able to complete the build by that day. What Loki didn't know is that the giant had a stallion who was helping him, and he was on track to finish the build and win this deal. That's when Loki decided to transform himself into a mare. In mare form, he went over and wooed this stallion and led him off into the woods. In the woods, one thing led to another. You know, and Loki, in mere form, ended up pregnant. After this, he gave birth to an eight legged spider horse for some reason that I do not know, and then he gave this weird baby spider horse to Odin as a gift, and apparently that is how he became a god. But also, this led to the giant being killed by Thor, so the story is both weird and very messed up. In our number eight spot today, we have Huitzilopochtli. Huitzilopochtli is a god in the Aztec religion, and he is the god of the sun, but also of war and human sacrifice. His origin story is a pretty wild one. So his mother is Coatlicue and she is very important. She already had other fully grown children when she was impregnated with him. Her grown children were the female deity Coalshaki and her 400 brothers. All of these children were really mad at how she became pregnant again and they began conspiring to kill her, which is absolutely nuts. This is when Huitzilopochtli burst from his mother's womb in full armor and he was also fully grown. He knew about the conspiring and he fought his brothers and sisters literally right after being born. He then beheaded his sister and threw her body off the mountaintop, which is honestly I don't know, kind of crazy, kind of dark. After this, he chased his brothers around and they became scattered all throughout the sky. This is why he is seen as the sun, his sister the moon, and his brothers are the stars. Number seven, Kraken. If none of the nonsense be something you wish, then he came to the right place, sir. The Kraken, arguably the most terrifying sea monster ever. I know I said that before, but no, I said most infamous. Famous? I don't know. It's scary. I'd even argue it's scarier than the Megalodon. Put a Megalodon on land. He's basically an oversized Magikarp. Kraken? Ooh, those tentacles and suction cups, they're going to hurt. And but he's got reach. The Kraken in most depictions is a gigantic octopus or squid-like creature who can destroy large shipping vessels with its huge tentacles and send them down to Davy Jones' locker. In Norse mythology, some depictions of the Octo Beast are as big as islands, which Ooh, that's really big. Sometimes creatures like this and other mythological stories come with lessons or a, a tale of something. And usually these creatures have a weakness or an exploit on how to defeat such a beast. However, in my research, all it said was that they could be defeated and not how. Number six, Blemier. Ready for a weird one? In ancient times, Europeans who traveled to North Africa and Asia came back telling some pretty crazy tales, specifically of humanoids who would wander the wilds. The absolutely weirdest one would have to be the Blemier from North Africa. They were big hairy dudes. That part ain't surprising, that's Big Chet over there. But they had no heads. Instead, they had a face on their chest, or even just eyes in the middle of their chest. 
I mean, look at the art our ancestors made of them. What even is that? Somebody call the police! <laughs> what the? They became a hot topic of interest and disgust and appeared in all kinds of stories and art at the time. I, for one, would never like to see them again. Thank you very much. I would never like to see that again. Thank you. Thank you. Number five, werewolf. Hey man, I, I just wanted to check up on you and make sure you're feeling all right. Uh, I know it was kind of strange that a large dog bit you in the full moon. Hey man, you're, you're a lot hairier than I remember you being. And, and gee, your teeth are pretty big too. Uh, say, what's that wagon going on behind you? Ah, I'm sure you're fine. Yes, werewolves, another classic, if you will. Part man, part wolf. And the ability to transform into said beast at a full moon. Some call it a power, some call it a curse. I think werewolves stand out on this list because they're so common. Werewolves were thought to be real in ancient Rome and most of medieval Europe. More interesting than a wolf that hungers for human flesh is the treatment for such an ailment. Some medieval remedies include hammering nails through hands. In Sicily, it was a knife through the skull three times. In Germany, if you said the person's Christian name three times, they would be cured. And in more recent times, silver. Just silver for some reason, or a silver bullet. So be mindful at night, folks. You may just need a hammer, nails, knife, Bible, telephone book, and a couple of quarters. The telephone book is so you can look up the Christian names. Number four, Slipnir. The steed of none other than Odin himself. Slipnir, or the sliding one of Norse mythology, was an eight-legged gigantic black horse that could carry itself and its rider across the land, sea, and through the air. Those eight massive powerful legs also helped bring Odin Allfather from the realm of Asgard to Midgard, or Earth. And I'm sure Sleipnir could bring him to all the other realms as well. Sleipnir here came to be when the god Loki shapeshifted into a mare and became pregnant by the stallion of a giant. Well, that's how the myth goes. Look, I can't come up with this stuff, okay? Just believe me so we can move on. In art, the giant horse was the means of transportation used by shamans in their travels throughout the cosmos. So when they were straight up tripping on the magical mushrooms over in the forest clearings of Norway. In our number three spot today, we have Firo. Firo comes from Maori mythology, and he is the lord of darkness and the embodiment of evil. He, of course, needs a home to match his dark persona, so he resides in the underworld. He is responsible for all illness of people, and some tribes believe that when people die, they descend into the underworld where Firo eats them, and for each body he consumes, he gains more strength, and eventually he may grow powerful enough to break free from the underworld. If he is able to do this, then he will be able to come to the surface and devour everyone and everything. This is why the people who followed this mythology believe so strongly in cremation, because he cannot gain strength from ashes. Firo lives in what is called the House of Death, and it is a dark, creepy cave that preserves all things evil like black magic and the personifications of illness and disease. I don't know about you guys, but personally, I hope Firo stays in his little cave safe and sound in the underworld because I don't want any part in whatever he's got going on. In our number two spot today, we have Guayota. Guayota is a deity that comes from the Guanche mythology of Tenerife. He is actually the primary dark god in this mythology and plays a very integral role in the story. He is represented as a black dog and also always had other black dogs around him that were actually demons. According to the legend, he lived inside the Teta volcano as it was a gateway to the underworld. At some point, he actually kidnapped Magek, who is the god of the sun, and shut them up in a volcano so as to throw the world into darkness. After humans prayed to their supreme god Akamen, he went and saved Magek and locked Guayota up inside the volcano instead. I think it's safe to say that a god who steals the sun and locks it away definitely needs to be hidden inside of a volcano. For sure the best place for them. In our number one spot today, we have Lamashtu. Lamashtu is a demon, monster, malevolent goddess or demigoddess who comes from Mesopotamian mythology and she certainly is terrible. Her name means she who erases, and this is because she would prey on women during childbirth and wait for them to be breastfeeding their new baby so that she could kidnap it and eat its flesh. I honestly don't know if it gets any darker than that. She was also known to disturb sleep and cause nightmares as one of her 
less worse qualities, but she would also be known to harm the environment, bound the muscles of men, and would bring sickness and disease. Mothers who were expecting children would wear an amulet that depicted her in order to protect their pregnancy from her. Some people would even leave offerings to keep her appeased, which would always be small feminine objects. Some women would even go as far as to summon Pazuzu, son of Hanbi, the demon god, in order to protect them from Lamashtu's evil, as Pazuzu was her one weakness. Pazuzu protected them either because he felt bad for the expectant mothers, or because he simply just hated Lamashtu. Either way, at least he was there to help instead of harm. There were some cultures where Lamashtu was regarded as a guardian, but that definitely was not the case for all. Number 10. The Griffin More strong than eight lions and a hundred eagles. Originating in the Middle East and then being adopted in Greek literature, griffins are a majestic amalgamated blend of the body and back legs of a lion mixed with the wings, beak, and talons of an eagle. These mythical creatures were praised for the intelligence they apparently possessed, as well as the fact that they clearly had excellent patience as they mated with one other griffin for life. But don't think that makes them any less ferocious or fearsome. They would rip things apart with their giant beaks and talons and could fly victims to the skies. We believe the idea of the griffin was actually inspired when Scythian nomads interacted with dinosaur bones in Central Asia, specifically the bones of the dinosaur Protoceratops, which, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Kind of looks like a bird-like creature if you like tilt your head maybe. Number nine, the Loch Ness Monster. Hi lad, be careful when you venture out into the water's depths. That deep water has a beast hiding, just waiting to spring up and cause trouble. Yes, the Loch Ness Monster, maybe the most famous of all the mythical creatures. No thanks, of course, to all the hysteria that surrounds the watery lass. Ever since a black and white photo from the 1930s emerged, so did interest in this mythological creature. Maybe because people were bored, gullible, or just the thought of a prehistoric animal still alive. In modern times, well, it was thought provoking. Some say it was a plesiosaur, some say it was a hoax, and funny enough, some think it was a whale's piece of deal. Which I had to include because it's very funny. Honestly, Adam and I googled whale gabagool and compared the two images, and uh, you know what? Yeah, that's my accepted theory now. It's probably it was probably a whale gabagool. Number eight, a basilisk. If you think I mean the snake from Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, then no. Well, yes. But also no. See, in the earliest mention of the basilisk in ancient Rome, it was a snake-like creature with a sort of crown. But then you fast forward to the Middle Ages and this thing is a serpent with the head of a rooster and the wings of a dragon or a bat. I don't know how we made that jump, but hey, that's just how she goes. It apparently had a very de-lifing bite and venom breath, which is interesting. But its main defense was the fact that it could end your time on Earth simply by looking at you. Sounds like my ex. No mention of petrifying people though. The basilisk supposedly originated in North Africa, but tales of European encounters are much more frequent. One particular incident from 1587 Poland tells us how a man clad in a mirror covered suit hunted and captured a basilisk after it consumed two small girls. Hmm. Number seven, Nishi Doc. Have you ever turned around at your desk thinking someone just called your name? Or could you have sworn you heard someone say your name walking home alone at night in the dark? This has definitely happened to me and it certainly makes me wonder whether there is a supernatural reason. Otherwise, why does almost every culture have a myth related to voices in the dark? The Nishidok from Hindu mythology is a dark entity that lures travelers deep into the forest areas by making it sound like a loved one is calling to them. This is the moment where curiosity could kill the cat because if it got the better of you, you could end up dead. The voices will lead you to a deserted area away from prying eyes and then snap, it will devour you. But what if it's actually someone I know who needs help? Well, there is one way to tell, wait for them to call a third time. The Nishidok can only say your name twice, so if it no longer says it again, keep moving as it is surely the Nishidok. Number six, Nail Ba. Part of the role that mythology plays is to establish rules and boundaries for society, especially children. If you don't want a young one playing by the river alone, you tell them a scary story about a monster who lives there so they won't go near it. But did they really have to go this hard with this one? Damn! Nail Ba is a terrifying, dark, demonic spirit that walks the streets visiting people's houses. Her name has been written on the doors and walls of small towns and villages in rural Bangalore to deter the spirit from entering. 
Some variations of the myth say that she is the spirit of a wandering bride seeking her husband. If you open the door to receive her, she will take the man of the house and bring bad luck to the household. Another version says, which is kind of where it gets confusing, says that should you open the door in the first place, you will be cursed to die within 24 hours. Apparently she speaks in the voices of your friends and family in order to appear more trustworthy. Villagers write her name on the door to ward her off, as they should. Number 5 Boba I love all the legends that circulate sleep paralysis. If you have ever experienced it, you know how terrifying it can be. We know that it is a global phenomenon as most cultures around the world have lore surrounding it. The one that belongs to Indian mythology is the boba. When people experience sleep paralysis, symptoms often include seeing shadowy figures, you're unable to move, there is pressure on your chest, pretty much having a nightmare while you're awake. The boba is said to be a horrific creature who causes it. Made of shadows, the boba's entity preys on those who sleep on their back. Very specific. So no side sleepers here. It strangles its victims to death while asleep and it is said to be a paranormal explanation for sleep paralysis. So side sleepers, like me, you're safe. If you sleep on your back, you're in trouble. Number 4 Hiran Yakshipo Is it better to be feared or respected? Respected, obviously, that's what I think. Because hopefully, no one will be looking to stab you in the back if they're so afraid of you, you know what I mean? So it was only a matter of time for the self-proclaimed king of demons, his words, not anyone else's, even his own son was like, nah dad. Even though he wasn't the one who did it, he wanted everyone to believe that he created the universe and that he was uncontrollable. His son was, of course, one of the ones who refused to take his belief. Not a good luck for him, so he of course tried to kill his own son. No love when you're the king of demons apparently, but every time he tried to even harm his son, he walked out of it unscathed. The reason, Vishnu was protecting him the entire time. But how would they get rid of his father? Well, because he could not be killed by a human, devil, or animal, Vishnu created a blend of creatures creating something entirely different. It was called Narasimha and one day at twilight, he laid on the king of demons lap and disemboweled him with his claws. I feel like the King of Demons was like, oh look a kitty thing, oh no no, ah, and then died. Number 3 Dragon Greetings foul beast, for I am Sergenicus, knight of the not so round table. I have come to skewer your winged wickedness and end your sour reign. Is what I would say if I was a knight in shining armor, with a broadsword and a shield. It's a classic story. There's always a knight and there's always a dragon that needs slaying. In European culture, dragons are depicted as large winged creatures, sometimes with the ability to breathe fire. Perhaps a representation or euphemism for a great challenge a knight may face. In Eastern culture like China, dragons have no wings and are more snake-like. However, both still look similar and both have the ability of flight. The Chinese dragon may also uh, be able to use magic, so a fire breather and sorcery. Ooh, somebody get my sword. It's gotta go. No, bad. Number two, Aramanthian boar. Hey, do you remember in the ancient extinct creatures video where we talked about Andrew Sarkis, Andrew's ancestor? Well, I think, I think this is it. A one ton boar with sharp and strong canine teeth. Only this one's in ancient Greece, not Mongolia, so maybe not. But the Aramanthian boar was part of the 12 heroic labors performed by the demigod Hercules. Hercules was tasked with capturing the boar that would come out every day and attack the people who lived by the Aramanthus mountain. Now, I don't know if you know, but boars are already just angry, jumped up pigs that have been known to literally end people's whole existences. So yeah, size those bad boys up with giant tusks and well, good luck Hercules. It is also said that the boar was actually the god Apollo in different form, but ah, I'm just gonna say it was Andrew Sarkis, even though I'm 99% sure they were extinct at the time of the ancient Greeks. Number one, mermaids. Ladies, you gotta put yourselves in our shoes. Imagine Adam and me on a vessel in the ocean for months on end, starving, thirsty, and lost. But I can always get lost in your eyes. Anyway, <laughs> suddenly some thick fog breaks, and there upon some shallow rocks is a woman who's missing her blouse and has a fish's lower half for her lower half. How can I not stop and ask for help and or directions? Of course every fish lady wants to be around men who haven't had a good wash since they left port. The myth all makes sense. In a nutshell, that's what it is. The only difference is whether or not the mermaid is going to help you or bring you to your demise. We'll see. I don't know. Number 10, the dedication of Eclavia. 
You know what you shouldn't do as a teacher? Make a student who is really talented self sabotage themselves so they don't beat out another kid, which is exactly what happened to Eclavia. Eclavia was a very talented young boy who lived deep in the forest among his tribe. He wanted to become the best archer in the world and he was very well on his way to becoming it. However, when he asked to become a student of the great Drona, he was denied due to his poor social standing. But Eclavia was not deterred. He built a statue of his idol instead and let it inspire him as he practiced archery every day. He became so skilled that when Drona learned of this, he was afraid he would surpass his best student, Arjuna. So he demanded that Clavia payment for studying under him, even though it wasn't technically under him, in the form of his right thumb. Then, sadly, this story doesn't really have a happy ending. The boy cut off his thumb right there and then, forfeiting his dreams of becoming the best in the biz. So overall, work hard to get where you want to and then give over to jealousy and have let someone cut your thumb off so that you'll never achieve it. Number 9, Manushwa. Confusing and terrifying? We love a little bit of everything here on Bumblebee, which is why I bring you Manushwa, a terrifying creature slash demon that delights in scratching the faces off its victims, a very specific thing, leaving them for dead. No one quite knows what it looks like, but the most common description is a hairy spider with soulless eyes. Spiders already have soulless eyes, I hate them. They are known for attacking only at night and sometimes cause strange blackouts before they attack. Now, many believed for a long time that it was simply the stuff of legend, a scary bedtime story told to make sure children behave. But in the early 2000s, the town of Kampur, India blamed several attacks on the creature. Several people reported attacks at night and awoke with strange abrasions on their faces. Even more mysteriously, the victims entirely blacked out on the events leading up to it. Police as well as civilians became so convinced that it was real and it was attacking their community that they led special searches at night. But then, almost as soon as they had begun, the attacks stopped, leaving behind yet another legend of a bedtime story becoming real. Number 8, The Devotion of Sordas. Genuine question for all of you. If you saw the most beautiful thing placed person in the world and knew that nothing else would ever be as perfect, would you wish to keep your sight or have your sight taken away because nothing would ever come close to it. Personally, I'd probably keep my sight because you never know. But Sardas was so devoted to Lord Krishna that he had his sight taken away again. He loved Krishna so much that he wrote song after song in his praise. Sardas was a blind man but had a heart for music. One day Sardas fell into a well and Krishna saved him. Radha, his companion, became jealous and against Krishna's orders saying to stay away from him, she went to him anyways. As she passed, Sardas clutched onto her anklets. When he wouldn't let go, she revealed herself but Sardas couldn't confirm her identity so he held on. Krishna then graced him with vision and let go of the anklets. He was so stunned at having finally seen his hero that he asked to be blind again as nothing would ever come close to it. My question is, if he was blind since birth, how would he even know what Radha looked like to identify her? Would he just have been overwhelmed by her amazing goddessness? I don't know. In our number 7 spot today we have Amit. Amit is an ancient Egyptian goddess with the head of a crocodile, the body of a lion or leopard, and the bottom of a hippopotamus. The name Amit means eater of the damned or devourer of the dead and that is honestly pretty much exactly what she is. She is greatly feared and for good reason. She lives near the scales of justice in Duat which is the Egyptian underworld. This is where she does her work. After a person dies their heart is weighed on the scales against the feather of truth. If the heart was light enough, the person would be allowed to pass to the afterlife, but Ahmed is always waiting for those whose hearts are heavy. If a person's heart was too heavy and unbalanced the scale, then Ahmed would eat the heart and they would be denied entry to the afterlife. It is said that the souls of those who were denied were destined to be restless forever. In our number 6 spot today we have Apollo. Apollo is the Greek god who is the son of Zeus and at a first glance he seems like a pretty likable guy, but he's done some extremely questionable things. You know what they say? say like father like son and in the case of Apollo that is pretty accurate considering he has quite a temper. Apollo has been known to punish people with illness and plague which is 
very dark. During the Trojan War, Apollo shot arrows that had been infected with the plague into a Greek camp. There's also another story about him where he was rejected by Cassandra, who was the daughter of King Priam and Queen Hecuba of Troy, so he decided to punish her. He gave her the ability to see the future, but only the tragedies that the future holds. And the worst part, if she told anyone, no one would believe her. In our number 5 spot today we have Berstuk. Berstuk is a Wendish evil god of the forest and he is known for his trickery. He is often described as being half man and half goat, but there are some sources which claim he is actually a shadow and doesn't have a human form at all and instead is more of a spirit of the woods. So here's what dark thing he's got going on. He likes to trick wanderers of the forest into getting lost. Yep, it's just literally a full on nightmare. He hangs out in the dark depths of the forest waiting for the moment to strike. Once a wanderer stumbles across his path, he'll play tricks where he changes the path in the woods, or he'll whisper in their ears to frighten them like it's the Chamber of Secrets, or he'll lay branches in their way so they'll trip and fall. And he does this all simply because he enjoys the suffering of others. Many of the other gods on this list also do some good things, but I couldn't find any happy or nice stories about this one. In our number 4 spot today we have Izanami and Izanagi. This is kind of like a 2 for 1 deal because both of these these people play a very big role in this story. Izanami no Mikoto comes to us from Japanese mythology and her name means she who invites. She is the goddess of both creation and death and she is the former wife of the god Izanagi no Mikoto. So it's a bit of a long story but basically at one point she dies. That's really all you need to know about that. This of course upsets her husband, so he goes to the land of the dead to find her. Once he does, he can't quite see her because I guess the visibility isn't great in the underworld. He then goes to take her home with him, but she says she can't leave because she has already eaten the food of the underworld, which has made her one with the dead. It's a common theme, I guess, in different religions. Later, when she's sleeping, he takes a torch up to her face and sees that she is no longer beautiful, but has rotting flesh with maggots, like as if she's like a zombie. At this point he runs the heck away because she woke up and is now trying to chase him down with her gross zombie face. He ends up making it all the way to the entrance to the world of the dead and he pushes a huge boulder in front of it that now separates the world of the dead from the world of the living, but it also sadly separates him from his wife. Of course she is mad at everything that just happened, even though she was acting pretty weird and is also dead. So she swears that she will kill 1000 living people every day because he left her there, and to this he replies that he will offer 1500. I mean, can we blame him? Number three, Raktabija. This dude seriously sounds terrifying and I don't know how anybody beat him, but it, they had to create a whole god to get rid of him. Raktabija wasn't just one demon in Indian mythology, he could simultaneously be hundreds, thousands, millions. If one drop of his blood hit the ground, another Raktabija would form. And worse than that, the creature would actually get more powerful when a new version of himself was formed. It was like a huge narcissistic thing. I'm not sure how that works, especially since he's only a tiny baby part. Which like, whoa, I'm so powerful. As you can imagine, he was incredibly difficult to defeat. Every time he spilled blood, it was like, whoa, there's more of you. So the gods combined all of their power and created Kali, the destroyer of demons. A grotesque looking goddess decorated with bloody limbs. You know the one, the lady with the multiple arms dancing about. Yeah. An equally fierce demon to face, Raktabija. During their battle, of course, his blood poured onto the ground from his wounds, creating thousands of demons. But instead of letting the blood drop to the floor, Kali pierced him and drank all of the blood so not a single drop would hit the floor. And that was how she destroyed him. Kind of like the OG battle vampire. Number 2, Putana. It takes some guts to take on the dude who was literally born to destroy you, but Putana thought she could do it. Putana was an evil demon who was passionate about taking the lives of the young. Needless to say, not someone you want at a daycare. When baby Krishna was born, it was foretold that he would destroy all the demons. Literally his job. So Putana thought she could take the guy out early. She disguised herself as a beautiful young woman, laced her breast with poison and entered his room. Because of her disguise, nobody thought twice and so she sat down to feed the babe. But unfortunately for her, she made a huge mistake. Krishna was born to destroy demons. Never mind the poison. And as he fed from her, he sucked her life away instead. Putana died in absolute agony and Krishna assured everyone that he was here to do one thing and one thing only, his job. And last but not least, number one, Mahisha Sura. Look, I can understand appreciating the beauty of an animal, but when bestiality is thrown into the mix, 
uh, we gotta pull the reins on that. I know Zeus from Greek mythology was all about that as well. It just seems to be a thing that gods like to do across the world. It's a global thing. Remember the King of Demons? Well, this was another demon king who was the son of the King of Demons, but not the one previously mentioned. But anyways, his mother was a buffalo. His father had fallen in love with the beauty of a buffalo and married her. Mahisha means buffalo and Asura means demon in Hindi, therefore buffalo demon. No man on this planet could kill him and he was a very confident dude. He started a war with the people and won. His power knew no bounds because of course what man could kill him? However, there was a catch. A man couldn't kill him, but a woman could. But what woman could kill someone so strong? So the gods created the goddess Durga, and she waged war on the tyrant, finally fulfilling the prophecy. Boy oh boy, do I love a loophole. 